Well, thank you, Nathan and Pete. You guys sound fantastic. Really, really beautiful. And thank you for uh, leading us into uh, the Worship in the Round service tonight. I also want to shout out to uh, Pastor Jeff for uh, a really excellent sermon uh, this morning. Uh, Not easy to take on money, especially in the the times we're in right now, but that was a, a word well done, and thank you for that. I'll be preaching from... Uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 15, uh, this evening. It's on verses 1 through 11. So if you'd open up your Bibles to that chapter, my sermon title is Abiding in the True Vine. Abiding in the True Vine. Well, let's pray for our time ahead. Heavenly Father, I pray that our message time this evening would be fruitful. As we open your perfect word, I pray this would be your message to those assembled via live stream. And by the power of your spirit, hearts would be open to receiving Holy Scripture. Lord, this message is lifted up to you as an act of love, obedience, and worship. And I pray that I would neither add to nor take anything away from your perfect truth for us this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, it really is my true privilege to take my turn in the Worship in the Round pulpit as we go month by month through the Gospel of John. You know, it's especially important that we stay faithful in uh, preaching this beautiful gospel uh, as we continue in quarantine. And though it's a bit more challenging to preach uh, by live stream, my heart is full tonight, and I hope this will uh, reach you in this extraordinary circumstance that we're in. By way of a short review, uh, before we look at tonight's text, last month, Pete Johnson preached us through the end of chapter 14 in John. And you may remember this is where Jesus described himself as the way and the truth and the life. The timing was in the last hours leading up to Jesus' betrayal and arrest. And our Lord had a lot to say to the disciples in this dramatic time of anticipation. And all of it is written down for us. Really, chapters 14 through 17 is a narration of what has been called the farewell discourse. Jesus was headed to the cross. And so our Lord was endeavoring to reassure the disciples. Let not your hearts be troubled, he told them. I go and prepare a place for you, and I will come again and take you to myself, he also assured them. And these were words of comfort that Jesus gave, but with the comfort came bold teaching. Bold teaching on the critical truths the disciples would need to go forward. First through the awful days ahead, but then later through the amazing mission that he had for them after his resurrection, that of advancing the gospel, first to the Jews and then to the Gentiles. And they were to be the foundation of the church, our church, Christ's church, the church we benefit from today and we're experiencing tonight. Jesus promised them the Holy Spirit in chapter 14, a little bit later, but he stayed on message that they would have to continue to have faith, to trust, And in drawing from their faith and trust, they were to obey, obey. And they were to obey along an arduous, suffering, filled road ahead. So chapter 15, our text for tonight is really a continuation of the themes of chapter 14 of the farewell discourse. Well, with that as backdrop, let me now read from the gospel text, verses 1 through 11, if you'd like to follow along. I am the true vine. And my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. And the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit, far apart from, for apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments, 
and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. Well, that verse one begins with an I am. I am the true vine. This is the last of seven I am statements in the whole of the Gospel of John. And John, interestingly, is the only gospel that contains all seven of Christ's I am statements. The other six are, I am the bread of life, I am the light of the world, I am the door, I am the good shepherd, I am the resurrection and the life, and I am the way, the truth, and the life. Well, each of these I am proclamations really takes us deeper into our understanding of Jesus' identity and his essential role in the salvation plan for mankind, the plan that began in the garden. You'll remember a plan which was both curse and and promise in the garden is narrated in Genesis 3.15. Remember God's pronouncement. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring and he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Well, the head bruiser is Jesus and the heel bruiser is Satan. Jesus' I am declarations also link him to the Old Testament revelation of God. In Exodus, God revealed his name to Moses. I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. That's Exodus 3.14. Thus, in all the Old Testament and all Hebrew tradition, I am is unquestionably understood as a name for God. So make no mistake, whenever Jesus made an I am statement in which he claimed attributes of deity, He was identifying himself as God. Make no mistake. So in verse one, Jesus, eternal God, the second member of the Trinity, possessing all the attributes of God, articulated throughout inspired scripture, is telling the disciples that he is the true vine. Well, what does he mean by this? What does he mean by the vine? Well, Jesus is using a metaphor. It's a a comparison. It's a word picture, an analogy to make a life and death proclamation. John MacArthur put it this way, and I appreciate this, and I'm quoting, the drama that unfolds in this analogy is simple. There is a vine, there is a vine dresser, and there are two kinds of branches. Branches that bear fruit and are pruned to bear more fruit, branches that don't bear fruit. Cut off, dried, burned, that's simple. Well, the branch connected to God represents a path of life The other, a path of death. Well, if you're taking notes, I'm gonna expand on each of these four elements of the analogy, the vine, the vine dresser, and the two kinds of branches, the non-fruit bearing branch versus the fruit bearing branch. So let's look first a bit deeper at the vine, the vine. Well, the vine reference would have meant a, a whole lot to the disciples because the Old Testament, really, Testament frequently refers to Israel as being a vine that God planted. The disciples probably recited Psalm 80, where in verses eight to nine, the psalmist says to God, you brought a vine out of Egypt and drove out the nations and planted it. You cleared the ground for it. It took deep root and filled the land. And they knew how God had brought Israel out of Egypt and planted it in the promised land. and. They they would have been familiar with the Hebrew prophets who likened Israel to a vine or a vineyard. They would know the words of Isaiah and Hosea who said that the vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the house of Israel. That's from Isaiah 5, 7. Israel was a luxuriant vine that yields its fruit. That's Hosea 10, 1. Well, the, the grape vine for Israel was a symbol of national life. And in fact, it was so precious a symbol that there was a huge gold grapevine decorating the gates of the temple in Jerusalem. And so the disciples, they would have also known the up and down history of Israel and her corporate failure to be the vine that God intended. So Jesus says, I am the true vine declaration was profound. It was profound. Well, Bible commentator Kent Hughes said this about that pronouncement, all conversation must have stopped at this powerful pronouncement. The force of Jesus' words were, you all know how Israel is pictured as a vine that is meant to produce refreshing fruit. Well, I am the fulfillment of all that symbol suggests. 
The vine demonstrates Jesus' identification. When Jesus says, I am the true vine, he's really saying, I am the true Israel. He is saying that he is the embodiment of all that Israel should have been, but wasn't. Of course, Israel did not faithfully execute her mission as God's representative. Her sins and lack of uh, repentance prevented her from being a faithful witness. And so Jesus said, I am the true vine. I am the true vine. And he said this to his closest friends gathered around him. You know, the timing of the telling of this, this pronouncement is important because it was only a short time before Judas would betray him. In fact, Judas had already left to do his infamous deed. You can read about that in John 13, verse 30. So Judas did not hear Jesus make this proclamation. I think that's an interesting foreshadowing of Judas's fate as a branch cut off. So Jesus was preparing the faithful 11. The 11 men remaining for his pending crucifixion, his resurrection, his subsequent departure for heaven, and then their mission to build the church. Farewell discourse. Well, Jesus wanted his friends, and not only those 11, but for all time, to know that he was not going to desert them, even though they would no longer enjoy his physical presence. It was his living energy, his spiritual reality, would continue to nourish and sustain them, just as the roots and trunk of a grapevine produce the energy that nourishes and sustains its branches while they develop fruit. Jesus wanted us, he wanted us, believers under quarantine today in Anchorage. He wanted us to know that even though we cannot see him, we are as closely connected to him as the branches of a vine are connected to its stem. Let that sink in for a second. Jesus wants us to know he's with us. Our desire to know and love him along with the energy to serve him will keep flowing into and through us as long as we abide in him. Abide in him. We'll come back to this idea of abiding in a minute. But I want to turn now to the vine dresser. Look now at the second part of verse 1 and all of verse 2. My father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. So in that word picture, the father is betrayed as the vine dresser. He's a caretaker who's invested, who is working to sustain and grow a healthy living vine and branches. And he will know. He will know in perfect inter-Trinitarian knowledge and awareness which ones are healthy branches and which ones are unhealthy branches. He's going to know. Vine branch health is measured in fruit production. And in verse 2, we see that Every branch that does not bear fruit, he takes away. He takes away. It means he cuts it off and disposes of it. Well, the method of disposal is found down in verse 6. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. Thrown into the fire and burned. This is a picture of permanent destruction, of eternal separation from life-giving connection, of torment. So went Judas... And so remains the fate of unbelievers who do not come by faith into an abiding relationship with Jesus Christ. The vine dresser, praise him, takes a different approach toward the healthy branches. In verse 2, we read, And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Well, pruning is done with a knife, folks, a sharp knife. And it's a sharp knife that's handled with surgical precision and it implies pain. And moreover, its pain producing purpose is to produce what? More and better fruit. The professionals that tend vineyards for a living, they know how important this pruning principle is. As do you green thumb types out there. I don't have a green thumb. Ask Sandy about the one plant that's in my office. If she didn't water it, it would be cut off. (laughs) Well, um, I don't really have a deep understanding of horticulture, but it makes total sense that a flourishing, high-producing vine requires a caretaker, a caretaker who will do what is necessary to produce the best results. 
And those results do require the cut of the knife. Do not miss this principle here. Do not miss this principle, especially in the here and the now. There is good and loving purpose in our suffering. Sometimes our pain is a result of our sins. We bring consequences upon ourselves. Other times, pain comes because we are bearing fruit and God wants us to bear more fruit. May that be our prayer, that we're bearing fruit and God wants us to bear more fruit. Nevertheless, the results of God's pruning will ultimately be beneficial for us, ultimately. Maybe not tomorrow, maybe not a week from now, maybe not six months from now, but these things are for his purposes and his glory, and we have to trust in that. Malcolm Muggeridge, in his book, Jesus Rediscovered, said this about the pruning principle, and I'm quoting, suppose you eliminated suffering, what a dreadful place the world would be. I would almost rather eliminate happiness The world would be the most ghastly place because everything that corrects the tendency of this unspeakable little creature man to feel over-important and over-pleased with himself would disappear. He's bad enough now, but he would be absolutely intolerable if he never suffered. James 1-2 says this, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Lacking in nothing. I would say this is a pretty timely word under our current circumstance, uh, wouldn't you? God is helping us, he's working on us, he's pruning us, he wants us to bear more fruit. One more thing about pruning, we cannot prune ourselves, and even if we could, we wouldn't remove what really has to go. One writer made this same point, saying this, the truth is what is noble and attractive in us has to come from the cutting we would have avoided. David in Psalm 119 said this in verse 67, before I was afflicted I went astray, but now I obey your word. And in verse 71 he said, it is good for me to be afflicted so that I might learn your decrees. Suffering. Suffering. It's the area of the Christian walk that we don't like to think about, but it comes upon us when we least expect it. You know, and it's been said that God's hand is never closer than when he prunes the vine. Take heart. Take heart in this ongoing pruning, blessed ones. Well, let's look now at the idea of abiding in Jesus and then what good fruit looks like. Jesus said in verses four and five, abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. The word abide basically means remain. And it is expressing the vital union existing between Christians and Jesus Christ. It's a vital, ongoing union. The reality of our salvation means that every Christian, every Christian remains inseparably connected to Christ. And it has to be in all areas of life. It's not just a touch and go on Sundays. It's in all areas of life. Believers depend on him for grace and the strength to obey. We look obediently to his word for instruction on how to live. We offer our deepest adoration and our praise in sincere worship to him. And we submit ourselves to his authority. The worship tonight was beautiful. That was heart worship to a God that my fellow pastors love. In some, Christians gratefully know Jesus Christ as the source and sustainer of their lives. Abiding in Christ evidences another thing. The most important thing, it evidences authentic salvation. The apostle John alluded to non-genuine salvation when he referred to defected professors of the faith. Later, when he wrote 1 John, when he said this in 1 John 2.19, they went out from us, but they were not really of us. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us. But they went out in order that it might be shown that they all are not of us. People with genuine faith will remain. 
They'll hang in there. They will abide. They won't defect. They won't deny Christ or abandon his truth. And Jesus reiterated the importance of abiding as a sign of real faith when he said, if you abide in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine. That's John chapter 8, verse 31. So let's now turn to the fruit. What is the fruit? What is the fruit we're supposed to see? What is the fruit we're supposed to produce? Well, as a quick review, Jesus said that no branch can even live, let alone produce leaves and fruit by itself. Cut off from the trunk, a branch is dead. And just as the vine's branches rely on being connected to the trunk to receive energy to bear fruit, so must we. So must the disciples. So must the disciples then. So must we as disciples now. Stay connected. And so the fruit we're going to see is the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit. The fruit that we're designed to produce is that of the Holy Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Galatians 5, verses 22 and 23. That's fruit. That's what you should see. Our source of life and spiritual fruit is not in ourselves. It's not in producing things that we get to take credit for. It is outside us in Christ Jesus. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. We can live and live rightly and serve him effectively only if we're connected to him in a faith and love relationship that's born of salvation. That has to come first. That has to be what happens before we can even understand the fruit of the Spirit. An authentic salvation wherein we're both sealed with the Spirit and we're indwelled with the Spirit. 2 Corinthians 1 verses 1 and 2 puts it this way. And it is God who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us and who also put his seal on us, the seal of the Spirit, and given us his Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. And Jesus underscored this truth strongly by saying in verse 5 in our text tonight, apart from me, you can do nothing. Nothing. Well, one writer drove this point home really well. He said this, this illustration of the vine and the branches is no thoughtless generality or careless simile. It is absolute stark reality. No believer can achieve anything of spiritual value independently of Christ Jesus. Well, all true branches bear fruit. This is why Jesus tells us in Matthew 7, by their fruit, you will know them. By your fruit, you will know them. Well, as we heard, those that do not produce good fruit are cut away and burned. It's a stark contrast. It couldn't be a more stark contrast. And again, the reference here is to apostates, those who profess to know Christ, but whose relationship with him is insincere. He neither called them, nor elected them, nor saved them, nor sustains them. And eventually, the fruitless branches are identified as not belonging to the vine, and they're removed for the sake of truth and for the benefit of the other branches. So we are to depend on Jesus for everything, everything, starting with our very life and salvation. For in him we live and move and have our being, Acts 17, 28. Without Christ, there's no reconciliation with God. No one can serve God effectively until he's connected with Jesus Christ by faith. Jesus is our only connection with God who gave life and who produces in us a fruitful life of righteousness and service. Well, the remainder of the chapter explains some outcomes or some results of an abiding relationship with Christ. God is glorified in it. That's verse 8. We can ask for help in prayer and he will hear us and answer us in keeping with his will. That's in verse seven. We'll want to obey and we will obey by keeping his commandments, which leads to love, inspired love, transcendent love. That's verses 10, 12, and 13. And this love, such love, is seen in the willingness to lay down our lives for one another, just as he laid down his life for us. This is real love. This is sacrificial love. 
Well, if you read down into verse 18 to 25, it comes at a cost. We see that the world hates us because it hated him. I think we see that going on today. No question about it. Well, verse 26 of John 15, it's the next to the last verse of the chapter, if you want to skip down there and look at that. It brings the narrative back to the time and place Jesus said these things to his faithful 11. We're back into the profound moment. Jesus has yet to face the cross. He's yet to suffer and die. He's yet to reappear in miraculous resurrection, and he is yet to ascend. But I think it's very interesting that he promises them the Holy Spirit after giving them this last and final, I am. Let me read the verse. But when the helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit have proved perfect unity in all things. All things, but most critically in the sovereign plan for our salvation. There was Godhead unity in the garden to save us. There was unity in all plans and purposes with the patriarchs and the nation of Israel. And there was awesome unity in Christ's condescension and passion. And there has been unity in the age we're in now leading up to tonight. Run to the Spirit, saints. Run. Walk by the Spirit. This is how we abide in Christ in the here and the now. Walk by the Spirit. And I'll uh, end with another quote from John MacArthur. He said this about obedience to the command to be filled with the Spirit. It's found in Ephesians 5. To be filled with the Spirit is to be under his total domination and control. And it requires the death of selfishness and the slaying of self-will. To be filled with God's spirit is to be filled with his word. And as we are filled with his word, it controls our thinking and action. Verse 27, the very last verse, Jesus says to them, they will go and be a witness. They will go and be a witness. He's saying to them, You'll be ready. You'll be ready. And you'll have what you need. I'll be with you.